recorded. Perfect. So I just wanted to thank everybody so much for joining us this evening. My name's Robin Hansberger, and with me today, I have Dan Hilborn and Brandon McLeod. I am going to pass the buck over to them to introduce themselves. But tonight is all about unlocking balance, speed, accuracy, and distance this off season. So we really wanted to take everybody through what that looks like through the AIM and Hansberger Physio Plus program. So tonight's going to be all about the golf MRI and off season performance plans. And I think that's what everybody's so excited to come together tonight and learn all about. So these two gentlemen truly are uh, the stars of the show. So I am going to pass things over to Brandon and Dan to introduce themselves. And then we're just going to dive right into it. Who would All like right, to thanks, get started? Uh, thanks, Robin. Um, I know a lot of people on the call. I've I had a quick look at the list. I think a lot of you already know me, but my name is Daniel Hillborn. Uh, I'm a certified athletic therapist, osteopath, uh, and Titleist Performance Institute Level 2 Medical Certified. Uh, but 15, just 15 plus years of clinical experience, 10 plus years uh, working with golfers from a wide range of skill levels, from kind of beginners to, to tour players. Um, worked at the Blue Jays, Canada Baseball, so lots of background with working with rotational athletes and kind of developing these programs to get uh, get the best out of the people that we work with. Been working with Brandon now for, what is it, four years or so now. Um, we're pretty excited to show you what uh, what we kind of have going on this offseason. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me, Brandon McLeod. For those of you who have met me before, PGA Canada Professional Class A, a teaching pro um, and director of instruction at the AIM Golf Academy, which is now located directly inside the Burger Physio Plus Clinic. Um, 15 plus years as an experience as a professional in the industry, coached the University of Guelph golf team for seven plus years, and that's kind of really where my uh, foray into the body connection with the Hansberger team and my instruction really began and we've been honing it uh, and developing it every year uh, we seem to kind of continually improve upon it and, and that's gotten us to where we are today and what we're here to talk to you about is our golf MRI and, and how it leads into our winter training programs. That's awesome and just quickly before we dive right into the heart of creating an off-season program I really just wanted to make sure that everybody felt comfortable asking questions at any time. So there's a few ways to do that tonight. Um, you can do that through the chat function. I'll be monitoring that. There's no silly questions. So please feel free to ask away or raise your hand and unmute yourself, um, whichever you're most comfortable. All right, guys, back over to you. Thanks. Cool. So the first thing we kind of chat about when we think about creating an off-season plan and something that we, oh, we lost the slides there. Can you see that? Right. There we go. Um, and, and we ask our players to kind of come in with a lot of this information before we begin. Um, it's first to kind of assess and evaluate the current season. What were we good at? What were we bad at? Um, in ways that they think that they can improve. And then a couple of goals for what we want to sort of achieve in the off season. Real key to that, and Brandon, I think we'll dive into this a little bit more, is the goals should be specific. Meaning like, I don't want to just hit more greens in regulation. But right now I'm at 12 and I want to average 14. We really need these goals to be specific because that helps us to create a plan for how to get you there. If you already hit 12 greens in regulation and you want to get to 14, that's a different plan than somebody that only hits five. Um, so that's one kind of goal that, we, that we, we look at with players. But we want to look at a number of different goals from a number of different aspects of your game. Uh, and again, I know Brandon's going to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, and then we understand the areas of weakness. Uh, we can kind of come up with a plan to how to be the most efficient way to achieving that, which leads us into, which is the golf MRI. So the golf MRI is a one hour swing assessment uh, and golf assessment with Brandon, followed by a one hour body assessment. And then we get into a one hour follow-up where we go kind of dive deep into the results um, and how to get you to achieve some of those goals. Yeah, I think you said, uh, said everything there perfectly, Dan. The one thing that I really kind of make sure that we do is goal setting is is making sure that we set kind of realistic goals right if we're an 18 handicap and our goal is to be a scratch okay yeah let's do it but you better be prepared to put in a lot of work so 
alongside of having those goals that are specific, let's make sure they're attainable. Um, and then once we attain the goals, we can reset the goal goals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I'll jump in here. Uh, our golf and swing assessment, we use all kinds of data to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on. We don't like to guess. We like to assess, measure. Sometimes it's an inundation of data for a player as they look at it. But for us, we're just trying to dive as deep as we can to really understand the why so we can fix the how. So we're measuring with ground force pressure on V1, uh, as well as video analysis. We're using the K-Motion KVS, which is measuring the uh, rotational speeds and kinematic sequence of your pelvis, your mid-back, your arm, and your hand. Um, and we're also using all of the ball flight and club data from Foresight. So we're really getting a really good picture um, as to why your balls are flying the way they do. Um, it could be something as easy as the lie angles are wrong, and that's why everything starts to the right. Uh, not typically the case, but we, we look at everything. So we kind of, as again, we don't guess, we assess. Once we assess, we understand the, the root cause of the problem, and then we can kind of really attack it from there. And as, as Dan will, will show you on the following slide, and why we have the follow-up is we want to make sure that what we're seeing in the golf swing matches with what's going on in the body assessment. And 99% of the time in our assessments, we find the same, let's call them failures in a golf swing is where we're going to see the problems in the body screen. And that's why we kind of do it the way we do uh, to really understand why you swing the club the way you do. And one of the big reasons that we do these kind of two together is we found through working with a lot of players and having a lot of players come to see us is we have a lot of golf coaches that are having their players do something that their body's just not capable of doing. Um, and that's really just a recipe for failure in the golf game, as well as pain, injury and, and frustration. So um, we'll dive into this a little bit more as we go, but that's um, kind of how we tie the two together. When we look at the body and biomechanical assessment, there's a number of different phases. We're going to dive through each of them a little bit. Um, as we kind of go through the assessment here. Um, I'm going to talk to the history, a movement screen. Uh, we look at body structure. Um, we're doing a lot of really cool stuff that, again, we'll chat about in a little bit with foot and uh, and shoe assessment. Uh, strength and power testing. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about vision, mental prep, nutrition, um, and heart rate variability and how monitoring all of these things becomes really crucial to playing uh, your best golf. First part of that assessment then is the if we kind of dive right into the assessment is the kind of the medical history and the movement history. A lot of people, we kind of, the question we get asked a lot is I'm here for a golf assessment. Why do you need to know about my history or what my general health injury surgeries at the end of the day, the main thing that we're trying to get from both a golf and a body side is how do you move and how can we create a swing that works for your body? Um, so we'll have players that have had things like um, abdominal issues, IBS, gallstones, uh, appendix removal. Um, they've broken their collarbone. Um, and that could be some of the root causes as to why they don't move effectively. So if we don't kind of do a bit of a dive into where you've been um, from a medical perspective, we may be missing some of the really important issues as to what's affecting movement. So this is a pretty quick part of the assessment, but um, pretty crucial. And obviously, as if we get into some more in-depth stuff, this part can take a little bit longer. Um, but again, our goal is root cause and history becomes incredibly important to, uh, to getting there. To add on to what Dan is saying there and, and, and just to kind of give you a really quick snippet as to why, um, Dan alluded to some stomach stuff that could happen and, and we started to dive into some stomach stuff that I had going on and I was hitting balls and we did a, a stomach treatment with me um, and then I went back to hitting balls and immediately all the data changed, right? So if you've got stuff going on that you really don't think is a huge problem, um, you'd be surprised to think or to find out how, you know, something as, as you know, stomach issues could, could create rotational problems in the golf swing. Or a long time ago, I was coaching a player who had a really bad accident and we were doing some stuff and, you know, it finally came out, you know, that he had cracked his sternum in the accident. And when we were like, Hey, remember when we had that whole injury question? And well, that was 10 years ago. I'm, I'm fully recovered from that. Well, that led to a lot of movement issues foundationally that we found. So that's why we dig so deep. Um, 
because we want, really want to understand why you move the way you do. Sorry to jump in there, Dan. No, awesome. That's uh, absolutely right. Um, so the next part after we kind of get through the history is what we kind of created is this golf movement screen. Um, and it's really a series of tests that a player needs to be able to get through before they can make an efficient golf swing. Um, too often, again, we see players come to us and they're trying to do something their body just isn't capable of. Um, and then when players start cheating biomechanically using incorrect joints or muscles, um, it leads to other problems. It can lead to pain and stiffness. It can lead to other swing faults, or it can lead to like non-permanent swing changes. Like if we're trying to correct a slice or a fade, and we're just trying to cheat our way out of it, it might give you a temporary fix, but it's not going to be something that's um, that's long-term. Um, an example that I use all the time, and we had a player that kind of came to us and they had a, a coach that was trying to get them to create this in to out path, but they didn't have any ability to create shoulder X or rear shoulder for a right-handed golfer, right shoulder external rotation. So they got up to the top of their backswing and they couldn't lay the club off. But again, their coach is trying to get them to lay the club off and hit a drop. The only way they could do that, I'm hoping you could see me here, is they would extend their low back. Again, that allows them to lay the club off, but now we're turning off core muscles, we're turning off our glute muscles, we're creating compression in our low back. Yes, we're getting this great into out path, but at what cost are we doing it? We start extending our low back. Does that lead to early extension? Does that lead to us swaying or sliding throughout the swing? So uh, it's not just about can we do the motion? It's are we physically capable of doing it and not creating a compensatory pattern somewhere else in the swing? And I think jump, Dan, can I jump in too? Of course. Also, you can look here, like here's my external rotation in my shoulder and it's pretty good. But all of a sudden I go into posture and it's and it's a little bit more limited as as we can start to see. I can't kind of get as far back as I can get it here without it. So also looking at things in a dynamic motion that we need in golf swing. External rotation is great if you can do it here, but if you can't do it in posture, yeah, who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Um. And again, like these are they're fairly simple moves, and we usually get players to own a lot of these movement patterns pretty quickly. But you're just not going to be able to create permanent change in your swing unless you can kind of own some of these simple patterns first. So really crucial that we get our players um, through these patterns pretty quickly and make sure they can own them uh, before we kind of move on. Jump in one uh, more time here, Dan, just jump in. I think yeah. Dan really alluded to something quickly and, and maybe it kind of, you missed it is like that golf movement screen. Like if you pass that like perfectly, that, that just means that you have the ability to make an efficient swing. And it, if you fail some parts of these, you know, we've seen most players fail these screens. That doesn't mean that you can't play great golf, but it may mean you might go 75, 87, right? So why? Why one day can we play great and the next day we can't play great? And, and that's to what Dan's alluding to there is your fit, your movement's not efficient and you can't repeat it on Saturday and Sunday. And then you really can't repeat it if you're doing something that matters and the pressure's up. So that's and that's where it kind of comes into the, the next part, which ties in greatly to what we're going to talk about next is when we look at structure. Um, and again, if we're not creating the right, creating range of motion from the right joints or using the right muscles to create motion, that's where, again, we're going to start cheating and that's going to lead to inconsistency. It's going to lead to pain, steps, and a number of different issues. So when we assess structure, we look at every major joint in the body. Um, the reason we look at every major joint is golf's a full body swing and every joint needs to move. And each joint to some effect will affect other joints within, in the body. So we use this, what's called the joint by joint approach in the body where every joint is either designed for mobility or stability. And then they alternate throughout the entire body. So if we look at the, um, the chart on the screen there, bottom of your foot, the arch is designed for stability, ankle for mobility, knee for stability, hip for mobility, or in um, lumbar spine for stability, thoracic spine for mobility, and so on and so forth, all the way out to the hands and the fingers. So if any one joint loses the ability to do its job, and that could be from previous injury, surgery, posture, repetitive stress, there could be a number of reasons why a joint forgets how to do its job. Going back to history, that could be from bowel issues or whatever that might be. Um, so if we lose the ability to do the job, we then start to compensate. At the bare minimum, the joint directly above and below are going to compensate. 
but that can work way up and down the chain. We can have people that have hip issues or mid back issues that come from a foot. Um, and if we don't kind of rule out all the joints, could we again, be missing a big piece of the puzzle that's leading to these, these breakdowns. Um, one of the real common ones that we also see is um, people who get too kyphotic or hunched forward through their upper back and they lose the ability to create core strength. They may be doing core strengthening four five, six times a week. But if we get really kyphotic through the upper back, we don't walk like a hunchback because the low back goes the other way and sways, which then again, lengthens our core muscles. So if we're not looking at kind of full picture of the body, we often miss a big piece as to where dysfunction is coming from, which is why it's important that we kind of rule out all these joints in the stru structure portion of, uh, of the assessment. Now, I have a great question um, from someone in the chat here. So yeah. when you're looking at all of these things, do you often find that people move better in everyday life as well with, with some of these assessments? Uh, do they pop? I, I, I'll jump in and then maybe Dan can jump in this. We, we find that the, the screens are showing us where your everyday movement is poor. So step walking up a stair, are you using the right muscles or are you quad and QL dominant, bending over to grab something off the ground? So we're seeing, we're really seeing a trend of bad, just foundational motor pattern issues with players across the board and those trends kind of are following into the gospel so yeah you're not anything it's it's more the foundational problem the, the swing problems come from the broken foundational movement correct if you move foundationally incorrectly in the golf swing then you definitely move foundationally incorrectly in everyday life and i think it's a way to do an example like if if everyone can see here, I'm, I'm on here and, and this is a screen we do. So if every time that I bend over to grab something off the ground and when I stand up, I use the wrong muscles and you can see how I arch my back to get up. And there's I, lots of space in between the bar and your back. I've used every single wrong muscle to do that motion of, of, of hinging at the hips. Now, pretty much every single person that we see has a problem with that hip hinge. Most of them are oh, yeah. early extension issues in their golf swing. Those two things go hand in hand. So to, to answer the question, Alan, it's the first thing that's broken. Your, your, your foundational movement's broken before you walk in the door, and that's why the swing is the problem. Gotcha. And I think you'll kind of see this as we get more into the uh, the program part of the section at the uh, at the end, when I think we kind of teach and work differently than um, kind of changing the way I think we look at golf. And it, it's let's not just teach you how to swing a golf club. Let's teach you how to functionally move better. And then how do we teach you golf once you can move? Because if you can't functionally move correctly, then doing something dynamic like swinging a golf club efficiently is going to be pretty challenging. That's I hope that answered the, the yeah, question. Yeah, I think that was great. Thanks. Um, cool. So the next thing that we look at, uh, if there's no other questions as part of the assessment, is uh, foot and shoe. Um, this is something we've started to do a little bit more recently, but hugely relevant uh, part of the golf game. So um, golf is a ground reaction for a sport, and our foot is how like is our direct link to the ground. If a player is wearing a shoe that isn't the correct shape or has the wrong um, components of mobility, stability. Um, you're not going to be able to utilize ground force effectively. You're not going to be able to transfer weight effectively. And ultimately, that's going to make the swing pretty challenging. So we look at golf shoes as more as a, of a piece of equipment versus a fashion piece. And I think too often, even at the PGA Tour level, players are wearing shoes as a fashion piece and not at all being looked at as performance. Um, so a lot of players are going to, almost all elite players are going to get fit for clubs, for their shafts, um, but we're going to fit players for their shoes. And sometimes we'll have players come in and they'll have a one, they'll have two different pairs of golf shoes. One they play in one day, one they play in the next. One shoe is a very rigid uh, stability shoe. The second shoe they play in is a mo more of a mobility shoe. I can fold it in half. I can wring it out like a wet towel. In reality, like that's like switching shafts. Imagine you played with a flex uh, uh, a flex shaft on one day and then a stiff shaft on the next day. It'd be pretty challenging to create 
the same swing time after time after time again. Um, and that's kind of what you're doing if you're playing with a, two completely different golf shoes. So we want to look at the shoe from, does your ankle Dorsey flex, plantar flex, can it invert, can it evert? Um, what is your, your calcaneus or your heel position, your forefoot or your, your arch? What position are these in? Does the shoe that you're wearing currently match it? Do you need orthotics? How does your foot move dynamically? All things that we need to assess. And again, it then comes back to, let's put you in a shoe and, and we need to retest that. So let's take a look at when we put you in a shoe that we think is right for your foot or put you in a pair of orthotics or whatever that might be. Does that improve club head speed? Does that, let's put you back on the pressure mat. Does that improve the way you use ground reaction force, your weight transfer? Uh, do you pick up club head speed, carry distance, whatever that might be? Does it change your path? Um, and a lot of times we will see, maybe not all of these things change, but simply by putting on the shoe that's right for your foot, we're going to see some changes almost immediately. Um, and something that's really crucial to, to playing better golf. We have had two players right off the top of my head as we're thinking about this, both university players. And in both cases, they needed not a custom orthotic, but um, a super feed is what we use, an insole to give them some support. Uh, and, and in both cases, one, one was a club and a half longer and one was uh, a full club longer instantly. Like swung, put them in, tie them up, 15 yards farther. So we, we, need, we need to ensure that we use our feet properly. And if we're putting shoes on and we, that are hindering that, that's a problem. And that's one of the things that, that it's honestly one of the reasons we invest and we incorporate technology so much into our, the different phases of our assessment, but also our programs, because without foundational data from a baseline perspective, and as you progress through your programming and through your training, we can actually measure the impacts of this happening. Now, tech never replaces a quality program, a quality assessment and quality training, but it does help us to track your progress along the way. Absolutely, Robin. Um, cool, next thing we're gonna look at as part of the assessment is kind of our strength, speed, uh, and power testing. Um, so really the main point purpose of this is, one, can you, do you have, we, we kind of start with a lot of core pelvic stability. Cause again, I think too often we see people go into strength, speed, power testing without the stability to support the speed. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the strength testing really helps to guide where we need to start our strength program. Like how, how much initial stability work do we do? How quickly can we get into to strength and power stuff? It gives us baseline measurements of things that we're going to test along the way to make sure we're seeing the improvements that we want to see. Um, and it really targets us to allow these to make, make all these strength and conditioning plans kind of personalized. Um, one thing that we look at with all of our players, um, and I think it's really, again, coming back to using some of the tech, why it's so important to, to see some of this is these are things that you just can't pick up with the naked eye. Um, and it's, it's important to be able to collect this data to really get to, again, root causes of the problem. So if we look at um, the graph on the screen there, I'm hoping everybody can see that. That's a, a K-Vest graph. Um, of somebody's kinematic sequence. Kinematic sequence in golf is essentially how we sequence or how we move individual pieces of our body, pelvis, spine, arm, hand, club, to effectively hit the golf ball. In any rotational sport, that's kind of the sequence and how we're going to create power and consistency is the pelvis needs to power and, and rotate first. It accelerates, decelerates, and that's going to slingshot the next segment. Pelvis, spine, arm, hand, club. So if we look at the graph and the graph on the left there with speed on the vertical axis and time kind of on the horizontal axis, you can see red, that red graph that goes out, loops up and down is pelvis. Green is the spine. Blue is the hand of the arm. Sorry, brown is the hand. So as it kind of goes, droops down below the line, that's the backswing. As it comes back up, that's as we transition. And then that line, I think, Robin, you can put the cursor on there, um, is impact. Um where the, they change color there on the graph on the left. Move over, uh, right, over, over. Oh. Right, guys. right, that line there is where impact is gonna be. So this is kind of a perfect sequence um, of how we should move. Is this pelvis comes first, followed by spine. So the pelvis is furthest to the left, followed by the spine, followed by the arm, 
followed by the hand. So we should see them move in that direction. And then we should see them incrementally getting faster. The graph on the right is actually um, an elite level junior player, highly ranked in Ontario on our way to a scholarship uh, next year at a D1 school. Um, so pretty elite player. And what you can see if you look at those two graphs is it looks nothing like an ideal sequence. Um, the biggest issue is if we look kind of at the, the red or the pelvis, is we can kind of see it accelerates up, decelerates, slows down, and then picks up speed again. Not a very efficient sequence. It's this up, speed up, slow down, speed up. Um, and this is somebody who experiences no pain, no major range of motion deficits, but physiologically, they're doing something that's causing this kind of pelvic stall out right at impact. When the pelvis stalls out right at impact, we then see kind of this, you can see all the next three segments kind of fire one, two, three, like there's no real dissociation between the two. Um, and that's because there's a little bit of a hip impingement or a left pelvic and hip alignment issue, uh, which is causing this stall out. It's causing her to early extend a little bit. But again, without collecting the data or seeing these little finite movements that you can't see with the naked eye, we could be missing a big piece of the puzzle. We also see that they're all not really segmented. I mean, they all kind of go together. So when we look at things like her log rolling um, and the, or the way she creates rotation and separation between her upper, lower and body, just doesn't do this very efficiently and kind of creates this really boxy turn um, versus having this really efficient sequence. On the left, you can kind of also see speeds, which we measure on the very left there. There's uh, pelvic speeds, spinal speeds, even further left than that, Robin, like the, the yeah, there you go. Um, so we can see how fast is her pelvis moving, how fast is the spine, how fast is the arm, how fast is the hand. Um, and it compares us to males or females in their age and, and sex demographic. So it really gives us a lot of information as to where they're lacking speed and then the graph as to how they're moving and sequencing. So really useful information that helps us put together um, efficient programs for our players. And Dan, you wouldn't have been able to see this just through a video analysis, would you? Not to this amount of detail. You like you might see the pelvis stall out of a hair, but like really not to this detail. And you're really not going to see the change in the same way. Like we're talking like hundreds of a second here in terms of movement. Um, so yeah, stuff that you're never going to see with the naked eye. And again, stuff that we want to see, assess, treat, and let's have them swing again. Can we change this after some strength and conditioning? Are the pelvic speeds improving? Because if they're not, we got to change something. So again, it's so important for us to reassess these currently throughout the plan to make sure that we're seeing the change that we want with this sequencing. So we don't see sequencing change. Yeah. We're not going to see like real permanent swing change. You're likely just kind of cheating around some other biomechanical breakdown. What we will see Robin in the video is, you know, I kind of call it the Matt, the Matt Kuchar kind of like, like, sag in the legs as they come through impact and in this particular drill we did see a, a, a visual pelvis backup yeah and she complained of of hooking the golf ball which doesn't surprise us because the body stops you lose control of the balance point of the club and then you lose the club face so what what we're finding with this speed spent uh, strength and power testing and it's something that i'm willing to hang my hat on is that Every player that we coach, we coach world-long drive hitters, top-ranked PGA Canada professionals, elite juniors, seniors, weekend warriors. Pick a level of golfer. What we're seeing is a trend of everybody's bodies lagging behind of what they were expecting them to get out of that swing. So my world-long drive hitter who wants to be faster than Kyle Berkshire and has 160 mile an hour ball speed or club speed and 230 ball speed. Well, his body's really telling him he, he can only control that club at 145 and 210 ball speed. Well, that's not what he wants. And my PGA Canada player who's trying to go to the Champions Tour, it's like, well, you know, he's, he's got a body of a five handicap, not a guy trying to be on the Champions Tour. And, and it just kind of goes on and on and on down the road, uh, down, the, down the road of, of golfers. So we're seeing this trend across everybody. And, and this player, it's like, yes, we see that data there, but – on, on on the video, without even seeing it, we're going to see, you know, maybe the legs bending a little bit through impact and not being able to withstand the pressure the ground throws in or heavy or, or, or poor contact. So, yes, the data for us tells Dan and I exactly what the root cause of the problem is. 
but visually you can kind of see the the body not being able to withstand the club. Like at 100 miles an hour, the club head weighs 80 pounds. So you better be able to keep that behind your hands. Again, which comes back to, and we'll chat about this a little bit later, but how we create um, strength and conditioning plans is again, it's too often we see people trying to do speed training before their body is capable of doing speed training. Um, and then we're just, again, we're not going to see changes in the sequencing or changes in ground force. It's just, you're creating speed the wrong ways. So, uh, well, again, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but, um, yeah, I think everybody's uh, kind of right on track there. Um, last couple of things we look at as part of the assessment, uh, vision, um, and specifically in our, as part of our assessment, we look at contrast sensitivity and obviously good vision is crucial, um, to lots of aspects of golf, but a really big emphasis should be put on putting. Uh, so contrast sensitivity is the visual ability to accurately perceive an object against the background. So poor contrast sensitivity can be picking up small changes in elevation or changes in uh, uh, the direction of grain, really challenging. Um, so while, as part of our swing assessment, we look at putting, like, do you, can you start the ball on a straight path? We'll look at equipment. We'll look at a lot of things. And if you can start the ball on a straight path, but you can't read the green, yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to be much of a putter. Um, and if you do fail some of these contrast and sensitivity tests, we have, uh, we work with a, a team of optometrists who can talk about whether that's supplementation or, or glasses, or is there vision training that needs to be done? So there's lots of ways to, to address these things based on why you're having contrast sensitivity issues. But again, something for putting that needs to be, to be ruled out is, can you even read a green, uh, effectively? And, what we found is that uh, as a lot of players really do struggle with the contrast sensitivity. An interesting trend that we're starting to find. We're, we're very fortunate that some golf academies are starting to trust us to, to look at their elite players and provide the, the MRI for them and, and provide the follow-up and ongoing body treatment with them. And an interesting trend is starting to happen with these elite players. We're just testing and every player who's complained about Issues in lag putting have failed the contrast sensitivity test from long range. Now I had an interesting conversation with the coach who's saying, well, he thinks it's, they're just not focusing from far, from far distances. And I said, well, are they not focusing because they're not focusing or are they not focusing because they can't see on what they need to focus on? So, you know, it's these little things that, you know, could make all the difference. And if they're not focusing, I mean, that kind of leads us into a whole other issue. Um, and really, it actually is the next issue that we're going to talk about as part of our assessment. It's kind of this. Get in there. Yeah, let, let me write in there nicely. Um, is the uh, the mental prep. Um, so a great golf swing really will only get you so far if you don't have like the focus, concentration, mental toughness to get through it. Um, so we screen all of our players using, uh, it's called the Creos Mental Preparedness Test. So um, Creos is uh, a leading online brain platform. Uh, it's used for a number of different uh, things. It works with concussions, ADHD, that type of stuff. Um, but we've actually had them specifically make us a test uh, that's used to assess golfers. Uh, and it looks at things like attention, focus, um, and based on how they score, and we'll chat again about this a little bit more, um, is how do we create a plan to improve mental prep? Um, I always like to tell uh, the story that when I, I worked with the Blue Jays years ago, uh, one of their sports psychologists um, worked with the Jays and he obviously worked with a number of uh, PGA uh, players as well, too. Um, we got to talking about golf and uh, the mental aspect of golf. And he asked me, how much of golf would you say is mental? And he said, it doesn't really matter what number you say, just give me a number. And I said, let's call it 50. Um, and you can agree or disagree with that number, but... I said 50%. And his next question was, how much time do you spend working on the mental aspect of your game? And my answer was zero. And his next his response was, how do you ever expect to play better than 50% of what you're capable of if you do 0% work on something that's 50% of your skill level? Um, so I think this is something that is incredibly underassessed in the game. Um, and even something that's worked on or treated even less in, in players. Um, and it's obviously really crucial to playing good golf is being able to to focus and create that attentional narrowing to focus in on the, the task at hand. People always talk about in golf, how do I find the zone? And what were you thinking about when you shot 29 on that round? Or, you know, Rory, when you shoot tournament records, a tiger, when you win by 12, like, 
you're, you get into this zone and like, how do you find the zone? Well, that's what we're kind of trying to, to find with these players is how can we get them to find what works for them to focus in? Because everybody's a little different. Everybody's got a little bit of stuff going on all over, but how can we train them to be able to focus in and focus in on the task at hand and not have any distractions going on? There's a really cool story I heard of Jack Nicholas putting. I can't remember what she was hoping it was, but he was going to put in and there was an accident on the road outside and he didn't back off the putt. He walked in and he hit it. And someone walked up to him on the way to the tee said, Jack, you didn't have to putt that putt. Like you could have just hit it. You didn't, you, you could have waited till the, the noise of the accident went away. And he, he said, what accident? <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, why these great players play great is they're able to focus in on the task at hand and take all distractions out of what's going on in the exterior. So it's a huge part of the game. And, and Dan's completely right. Who works on it? And we have some really cool ways that we are, we're starting to train some of our athletes to work on this. And again, we'll, we'll dive into uh, in a few minutes here. Um, but crucial, crucial, crucial um, to playing, uh, to playing better golf. It always reminds me of the greatest game ever played um, with Shia LaBeouf, where he's able to actually just focus on the green. And, and there's a few really great scenes where they talk about mental preparedness, um, where he's able just to kind of clear out all the crowd, all the chatter, and really just look like he's hitting into just this massive green field. If you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend that one. Totally, Robin. And as you're talking about that, Robin, I can think of two PGA Tour players right off the top of that and do it really good. One is, unfortunately, a little bit of a slower player, Jason Day, but him and Tiger Woods all the time, you see them behind the ball, closing their eyes, breathing, and visualizing the shot. So it's it's a key part of this. Awesome. Um, so the last really uh, couple areas we, we look at um, as part of the assessment, one is nutrition. Um, which is obviously hugely important to play your best golf, avoiding pain, injury, burnout. Um, so all of our players, we have an app that we use and we have them do a, uh, three or four, a three or four day food journal, uh, just to get a general idea of what macronutrient intake, caloric intake. Um, and then we have a team of uh, nutritionists that we work with that we can, if that's, if you're an elite level player, like nutrition is crucial to, um, to performance and again, avoiding injury. Um, and the one other thing that we look for a lot, especially as we're entering into a strength training program is your protein intake. So the average person needs about 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight, just to rebuild muscle that they use in just everyday life. If we're in a, an elite or any type of strength training program, that can move to 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Some research may even suggest up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So a 160 pound person would need somewhere from 125 to 160 grams of protein daily. For reference, a chicken breast has about 25 grams of protein. So if you're exercising to be able to get enough protein intake, that would be somewhere between five to six chicken breasts a day. And in no way am I advocating that you should eat that many chicken breasts because that would cause a whole slew of other problems. But that's how much protein you need. And very few people are ingesting that much protein to make up for what they're breaking down and need to rebuild after a training session or playing around a golf or whatever that might be. Cool. Um, last part we look at, um, and this is really crucial to, especially to the more elite players is, um, is heart rate variability. Um, so we'll get a little bit, little science-y here, just talking about what it is. And then we'll talk a little bit about how it affects our players. Um, but it's the measure of the variation of time between heartbeats. Long story short, that's the most reliable way, the most reliable way to measure autonomic nervous system function. Our autonomic nervous system regulates everything from heart rate, breathing rate, blood pressure, glucose levels. And then we have two parts of our autonomic nervous system, which is sympathetic, which is our body's fight or flight mechanism, or parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. As our, our body will go back and forth, sympathetic, parasympathetic, 
as we put stresses on our body. So that could be stress from a training program. That could be physical stress. Um, you had a stressful day at work. You had a fight with your significant other. Your kids are stressing you out, whatever that might be. That can will put us into that sympathetic or fight or flight state. If we have a good, healthy nervous system, it should shift back. Parasympathetic should kick in and bring us back to these more rested states pretty quickly. Um, but what we're finding with a lot of players as we're tracking this is a lot of players are spending too much time in the sympathetic or fight or flight tone. And this is really relevant for us to measure for people as we're starting to increase load in a training plan. So if somebody is increasing their load um, and we're pushing them in the gym through hitting golf balls, playing, whatever that might be, and we're seeing these, um, these heart rate variability scores drop, which indicates, again, they're in the sympathetic tone. That kind of allows us to pick up before it happens. Are we leading to burnout? Are we leading to injury? Are we leading to diminished performance? And if we're spending too much time in this sympathetic state, that's what's going to happen. So it's almost like a cheat code for ways that we can pick up on things before they happen to make sure that we're keeping you in these steady states to allow for maximal performance increases and maximal performance on the course. So it's an app that we use the HRV4 training app. Um, really inexpensive, really effective uh, to use. So we recommend that almost all of our players um, start uh, recording their own uh, their own scores daily and tracking them. And then we also offer coaching plans where you can record them on your phone and we, act, we all the data will be sent to us. So if you have a big tournament coming up where we just put you into a, a new strength plan and we see those scores drop, we're going to reach out to you right away. How do we change this? Why is why are your scores down? Do you need to come in for treatment? Do we need to do some breathing exercises? Do we need to work on alignment? Whatever that is, is we, we need to make sure you, you don't stay for more than a day in this sympathetic state. Because again, that's indicating that we're either pushing you too hard or there's some stressor in your life that you're not responding well to. And again, that's going to lead to performance issues, pain, injury, burnout. And, and one of the key things, I mean, that we're doing with our world long drive hitter is, is actively monitoring this athlete. So depending on the elite, the sort of level of a player, this would be built into regular monitoring of your ongoing program. And then I think this is something you guys will dive into a little bit later as well. Well, yeah, and, absolutely. And so on that, on that point, Robin, uh, world championships start Thursday, Great, Go Cody. Um, and he reached out to me, we were talking last week, talked every day, but we were texting back and forth and he said, I don't know, coach, I, I'm thinking about having a rest day, um, kind of four days out. And I was kind of like, well, we're four days out, but let's push it again. Let's look at the score. He was in the green, parasympathetic, like ready to go. I'm like, dude, foot on the gas pedal. Let's not let up now. Now we looked at that and that said, you know, yellow or red, yeah, we're shutting them down there. But we were able to look at that score and say, no, keep the pedal down. Let's keep pushing here. You're in the green. Green means go. Yeah, absolutely. And I, again, I guess I kind of did harp on a lot of the, this is when we need to slow you down, but that's also, hey, we can ramp you up or maybe we're not pushing you hard enough uh, if we're not seeing some parasympathetic uh, tone kick in a little bit as long. We just want you to make sure that you're, you recover quickly from it and how do we monitor the load that we're putting on uh, onto the players. Again, we go through a lot of these stuff in the assessment. We're going to go over a sample in a second here of kind of what the, the MRI report looks like. But once we go through this whole assessment process, it's kind of for the more elite players. Yeah. It's like, you need heart rate variability. You need to look at diet. We need to look at mental prep. If you're a club member, you're just looking to play on the weekends, compete in, member guests and that type of stuff like yeah we're probably not going to send you to our nutritionist unless that's something that you want to look in for your every life so it kind of turns into this a la carte program based on what your goals are on the level that you're you're playing at cool um next this a uh, quick sample so after we've gone through the whole assessment we get into this report where brandon will sit down with uh with every player that we do the mri with and who's going to have a similar um kind of file for this, it goes through everything from the swing, everything from the body, um, and then the plan to how we're going to get you to your goal. So I'll let Brandon just chat a little bit about yeah. uh, the go back one there, Robin. You can go back one, yeah. yeah. So we're going to start, you, well, yeah, we're going to start there. We see full swing data, and now this is one of our, 
our junior elite players that we're working with another academy who's sending them to us to kind of help them gain speed, power, and, and stability. So one thing that's missing on this particular one is we also take an in-depth look in the in the swing analysis of your short game. Do you use the bounce correctly? Are you spinning it enough? What's your grinds like? Are you the right one? So we kind of look at at all of that. And, and in reality, if if you're making poor contact on your chips and your pitches, you pretty much can bet the house that you're going to have impact issues on your pitching wedge seven on the driver. So we kind of start at the bottom, work our way up, um, and and then and then go from from there. So this establishes our baseline. It allows me to look at your lie angles at, at impact. Are they level or are they up or down? We could have impact issues just because your clubs aren't fit properly for you. And then we kind of look at the numbers on the spin. So your seven iron, you're hitting at a certain speed that to optimize flight, you should be spinning it at X. And we look at all these things and that kind of ties up with the, the video analysis and the data to give me the summary for this player. So you can see there, I'm making a recommendation on their golf equipment. This player um, had a lie, had some lie angle issues. So presented the club with their wedge three, three degrees down and with their seven irons, two degrees down. So we kind of looked at, Hey, let's, let's look at these clubs um, as we get closer to the season. Uh, because there's some lie angle issues there. Let's not do them while we're working on the golf swing. And then we kind of look at the full swing. Of well, and as what, we're working with the body too, right? Because as we teach people to hip hinge more effectively or change their posture, some of these things might change on their own as well too. Yeah. Um, so it's not always, hey, let's go and bend these clubs or let's get fit for something new. It's let, let's see how we can change this, whether that's through form, strengthening, postural work, whatever that, that might be. True, true that, true that. Um, so then we kind of look at the body assessment, um, and here's just like a really kind of quick overview. I'm not going to go through this in a, in a ton of detail, uh, but on the left there, just a really quick body assessment. Uh, this player struggled with log rolling and, and creating upper and lower body dissociation, uh, which is some of the functional or that, that movement screen stuff that we needed to look at. So kind of first goal was looking at how do we get her to pass that movement screen, um, improving functional core strength. Uh, creating a periodization program to strengthen at the right times. Um, she actually failed the distance contrast sensitivity testing. So we talked about, again, this is one of our more elite D1 players. So it's, we want to send them to um, the optometrist to look into the eye issues. Um, if we look at the Creo scores in the top right corner there, um, she didn't do, she scored low in the uh, response inhibition, the 35th percentile. Um, response inhibition is your ability to put out distractions and focus on the task at hand. Um, so that's kind of like that Jack Nicholas example. He didn't even hear the accident in the back. This player would not be very good at that. They'd probably step off the ball and be thinking about the accident for the next 10 minutes. Um, so this is something that we need to address in further neurocognitive testing. And it's uh, going to be an important part uh, of our plan um, and go to the next one. I think that might, yeah. Um, so that was just kind of a general overview of what you get and what Brandon will go over with you. Um, and really how does what we see in the swing and how do what we see in the body correlate to one another? And in the follow-up, we typically do it always at, at the clinic. I like to put in a couple of changes that we'd like to see at that point. Typically in an MRI, we see some postural stuff. We, we give them some cues on, on some setup changes my foundation in the academy is like everything starts with the address position. Like if we're, if we've got the posterior chain of muscles unplugged and then we want to use it in the, in the golf swing, it kind of is counterintuitive to that, making that happen. So I, in the follow-up, go through the data, pick the stuff that's important as again, you're inundated with data. Like there's just a lot. And we, in the follow-up will pick out and highlight that's what we do in the report the main things, we'll give you the handout, but I'll sit down, here's the main things that we need to focus on. And then we do a little 20, 20 to 25 minutes of, all right, now we start to get into some work on wherever that player may be, the, the one that you saw there, it was just about getting their weight transfer on time. So again, improving some posture stuff in the setup and the end of that follow-up was just giving her in particular, 
a feeling of, of what it felt like to get weight transfer on time. So that's what the, the follow-up is, 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 is giving you a, a full understanding, lets you digest the information, give you the start of where we're going to move on the plan and then execute that as we go along. So this player in particular, they're coming to see us strictly just for body work. They're going to see me for motor pattern training, uh, for golf. That's it. Do all the golf stuff with their coach. Uh, but if it was one of our other players, we would sit down and at this point go, okay, you know, it's twice a, twice a month. What days work for you? We would build out the schedule at this point in the follow-up and, and make sure that by April, May, June, whenever their season starts, they're ready to rock and roll and attack those goals we set at the beginning of the session. Yeah, so that's kind of what we were just leading into is like the follow-up, like from Brandon's side, um, golf lessons, a motor pattern retraining, which he's going to talk about in a second. Um, short game, course management, equipment, and all that. From the body side, it's at the beginning, do you need some hands-on treatment? Do we need strength and conditioning? Do we need, when do we move into power uh, and strength training, neurocognitive? Um, do, we, do we start, let's start recording our heart rate variability and get a baseline for there. So it's kind of that follow-up is let's get everything started and let's get you on plan for where the first month needs to be. Um, and then we kind of reassess it and move on from, from there. Awesome. Now, a, a great, a great question. Um, and you guys may be getting to this. Um, so if you, if, if one of our clients or, um, someone interested in the MRI currently works with another coach, this is still a program, um, that they can go through with you guys, correct? A hundred percent. And I'd say in that instance, it would, we've had, this happened a few times, but the best, the best time is, is if, if, uh, if I can talk to the pro or they just know that it's happening and then I can kind of have a, a, an understanding of what they're trying to do ahead of time as well. So yeah, collaboration with other pros. And Brandon are- works a lot. Um, and we're, again, we'll dive into this in just a second. I think Brandon will talk a little bit more about it. Um, but for the players that work with other coaches, like Brandon does a lot of these sessions where it's motor pattern relearning. So you may come in for a quote unquote golf lesson, but you're not even going to bring a golf club. Um, it's using other tools that we have to teach weight transfer, to teach how to create ground force, stuff that you can then take back to your coach and keep working on what you're currently doing. And really the best way to do this is have an open line of communication with, with that coach. And um, if they want to come for part of the, the MRI follow-up, or if they want to chat with us, like we're, we're open, like we want to chat with them. Cause I like, if we're working individuals of one another yeah we're going to send mixed messages but we're not going to get to the the root causes of things we, we absolutely want to work with people's um their coaches and how do we create a team approach to to getting you to where you uh where you want to be bang on dan and, and i i come with a background of being a university golf coach for seven years so in that role sorry to interrupt you brandon we might as well get this all okay. recorded so so yeah so Many of you who've worked with us and seen it, like that's where this golf forever training bar system really began. And we started to see that we could change motor patterns way more effectively and create dynamic fields for players um, in a way we've never been able to before. So we started to say like, well, there's no sense in trying to get this player to practice some move in the golf swing when, when they don't even know how to hip hinge properly or they don't know how to simply disassociate their upper from their lower half. So we started to say, well, let's, let's fix these foundational movements and let's make those so solid in a player that they can do them without thinking. And then all of a sudden we started to see a lot of things um, disappear from, from, from issues in the golf swing. And we found there's, there's really four, um, core principles of movements for our athletes. Hip hinge, upper and lower body disassociation, balance and stability, and core strength and control. And as I said, doesn't matter the level of golfer, we're seeing problems with players on all four levels of those across the board. So it, this, this golf motor pattern training is <clears throat> typically, if we were periodizing this program effectively. It would start in November. We would do hard motor pattern retraining November, December, so that when we jump in and we start to go and do the 
the swing training and the changes that we'd like to make in the swing, they become very easy. Um, it's hard if, if you don't know how to lift your arms up above your head and do it with the bar. You don't know how to lift your arms up above your head without going into an anterior tilt. It's going to be a very hard thing at the top of your back swing to avoid the same issue. And what we typically see that's where some speed control issues in back swing happen as well. So let's Let's just fix those foundational moves, make you a really strong, fundamentally good mover. And then we can develop a really strong golfer from there. So that's how that program came about. And we're so excited to start to take you guys through here and, and really just make you good quality movers first and foremost. And, and then you can become amazing golfers from there. Absolutely. And that's where we kind of build a, like a strength program off of that. Um, and the real key is we want to work with your coach, with Brandon to say, Hey, like we've done the, the, uh, the assessment, we know where you don't move well, but then it has to be kind of this ongoing conversation is we've been at the strength training stuff for a couple of months. What are you still, what are you still doing in your swing that they're trying to change? And how do we continue to put you on a strength program and how often you need to work on it? Um, what do you need to do before you, you hit golf balls to warm up, to make sure your body's in a position to be efficient at, at creating a good swing. So uh, we kind of put these strength plans together and the, and the real goal is making sure that it's directly affecting what your coach is asking you to do. Um, and some of this will be like foundational movements, squatting or simple press movements, deadlifting. Um, but some really golf specific movements that go into these programs um, to ensure that you can really own these motor patterns that they're trying to change in your swing. Um, awesome. So, Again, the teaching philosophy for us, it's evolved over the years, but it really comes down to us only asking you to do what your body is capable of doing. There's always this, this, this back and forth when we start to learn with players and I'm, I'm constantly asking the Hansberger team questions right in front of the player. And we're just trying to figure out, can they or can't they? If you can do what, what we're testing, well, then I can coach it. If you can't do it, I could ask you to do that same move a hundred million different times in a different way and you, you'll never do it. So what we've come to find is that most mistakes in golf swings are coming from golfers just simply asking them to do something with their body that it can't do. Move the club to the top of the back swing farther than we've got range of motion for, leading to all kinds of issues. Or swing the club faster than we're able to maintain balance and stability with it. Like, those kind of two things are the same things we see with players across all levels. So we've kind of come up with these pillars that we work on and it's like, we've got to own our address, like great swings start from a strong foundational um, piece of, uh, of setup. Like if we don't have our posterior chain of muscles on and I'm using kind of body words, but if we don't have all these muscles in the back turned on, how can we make a solid swing? It's a ground reaction sport. Swings need to start from the ground up. So we build these swings from the basement and we make sure that we build them up to the top. That way they can be repeatable. Um, always swinging within yourself. Again, like my clubs are at the academy, but I would be holding up a club here now and, and, and I've simplified golf in my mind. It's like every golf club has a balance point where you could hold it on one finger and it wouldn't fall over. And, to simplify golf, we're just trying to own that balance point, right? So when we stay within ourselves and swing at a speed that we can control the balance point, better results happen. Again, going back to not asking our body to do something that it can't do. And the last thing that I, I really try to drive home with our players is like, we need to drive through the ball, not to the ball, right? We don't want to be decelerating, but lots of that deceleration comes from point three up above where we're asking our body to go farther than it can go. So we accelerate a little bit too early and then we're, we've got nothing left at the golf ball. So being aggressive through impact is, is really kind of a critical piece of a pillar of, of what we do. So own our address, swing from the ground up, stay within what your body can do. That way we can repeat it and be aggressive through the ball. Like those are what we preach 
in our lessons and what we try to get our players to do. Awesome. We do have a question um, yeah. coming from chat. Is speed training something that can be incorporated? Or are we looking at two separate programs? No nope. training. Uh, great time for that question, actually, because we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, but speed training, 100%, and I'll let Dan, Dan jump in, but there's no sense in training speed if we can't support it. So we'll go back to our world long drive hitter, and we've referenced him a few times, but he swings the club at 161 miles an hour at his peak. He's been sending me his median average club head speeds, and they're like 155. Now, his peak when we first started working with him was 153. That was peak. So we've gained eight miles an hour on his peak, and his median has also rose about eight miles an hour. We've done zero speed training with him. Zero. Because he cannot stabilize the speed that he has. So we have multiple conversations with our players all the time. I want to get faster. I want to get faster. It's like, you don't know how to use the speed you have yet. So let's get your stabilized. Let's get you, let's periodize. I'll let Dan jump in in a second. Yeah. But we can't work on speed until our body is ready for speed. Again, I'll circle back. We are always asking our body to do things more than it can. Like we can't stabilize 115 and we're trying to push it to 118. And yet we can't hit 115 in the middle of the fairway. So let's make sure we can stabilize before we can create speed i'll let you take it from here yeah absolutely so like yes the, the it's a simple question yes we do a lot of speed and power training but the biggest issue that we see across the board is when people are doing speed and power training is they're doing it too early or they're doing it like brandon said before they're able to stabilize the power the second thing when it comes to speed and power training is we have to look at how do we periodize these plans and what we mean by that is we want you to peak for certain events. That's a big part of what we talk about in the initial assessment is what are you looking to do in this upcoming season? Um, is there a big event that you're playing in the middle of summer? Are you going to college next year? Are you going to some big qualifier, whatever that might be, or you probably have a couple throughout the summer. It's we need to make sure we periodize speed and power to have you peaking at the right times. You could only hold a peak within speed and power for four to five weeks. So doing speed training at this time, um, like if doing it now to peak in January um, would kind of be irrelevant because we're not going to be able to maintain that leading into the season. So speed and power training is something that's going to happen leader, again, closer to the season. But the most important thing is making sure that we're not asking you to swing quicker than you can stabilize at. Because again, that's just going to lead to inconsistency. And again, from what we found is as we teach people to, like you, like Brandon just said, is he hasn't done any swing training with the long or speed training with his long drive guy, but he's taught him how to use the ground more effectively to create vertical for us. He's taught him how to get onto his front foot more effectively, how to activate the glutes, how to activate all these muscles more effectively. And with no speed training at all, dramatic increases in club head speed. So, um, the, the answer is yes, and speed and power training will be part of it. But again, I think this gets asked way too much um, for players doing something they're not capable of. And again, it's just a quick example. Um, we had a junior player sent to us from um, uh, one of, uh, again, another academy who went to go and do, uh, sent him to do some strength and, or sent her to, sorry, to do some strength and power training. And she actually came back slower. Um, and this is actually the same player that we used in that, um, if you remember that graph where she had the pelvis accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. So they were doing the speed and power training, but they were doing it on a broken motor pattern. So she got a little bit faster, but the problem is initially she probably got stronger and a little bit faster, but because she would load into that hip when she started to create rotational speed and power is her hip just wouldn't let her do it. She got faster, it, it impinged onto that left hip, she had to slow down and she actually came back again to this coach with slower speeds than she did before. So, um, again, and I think it's a huge problem in the golf world. Let me jump in on that. To yeah. Get to, but let's follow up. Uh, let's finish the story on her. She's come through her MRI came through on her follow-up and she gained, it was yesterday. She was hitting balls and in our follow-up and we tested her with her seven iron. 
and her seven iron was 92 miles an hour, ball speed, ball speed. And we were going through our MRI follow-up and just doing some foundational stuff, like move on time, get your address turned on. And she was hitting shots and, and I called the dad over and I was like, you know, Brian, what do you think? It's seven miles an hour faster, pretty good, right? We've only really done a little bit of stuff here, about 20 minutes. And I said, that's pretty good on the seven iron. And the daughter, the, the, the athlete said, but I'm hitting an eight iron. And I was like, well, even better. We gained, <laughs> we gained seven miles an hour on her seven iron speed with her eight iron. Um, so again, beating a dead horse here, no speed training, um, and we probably won't do speed training with her until, gosh, February. And um, we'll probably be later than that, depending on the competitive. Yeah. And then she's going off to college next year, so we'll be kind of peak for the summer events, ramp it down, and then slow it back or speed it back up again, leading but, into to college. And again, that's kind of when we look at these periodizing programs. Why it's so important to kind of start these sooner rather than later like get in for the the assessment let's see where you at and let's get you mastering the movement patterns let's own the core stability and the foundational movements now so if we start these plans in, in january we might not get the core stability to be able to get it into speed training and we're just going to be like this this example that we saw where you're going to do speed training and you're going to come back slower or you're going to lose control and yeah you're going to be swinging five ten miles an hour faster but your ball's off the planet and that's not really effective speed training at the end of the day. Or even better, which is probably a likely scenario for this player, um, is we're just going to gain 25 to 30 yards of event speed training anyways. And then we're looking, all right, well, you want you still want to get faster? Or like was 30 yards enough for now? So, um, yeah, speed, speed's a part of everything. A natural occurrence of our program is players get faster. It's just part of the process. We make you move better. We make you move efficiently. That just equals speed. Absolutely. Um, cool. I think the last real part here of uh, kind of how we design the plans is um, when we've gone through that Creos, that mental prep screen or mental preparedness screen that we talked about, um, look at things like focus, concentration, neurocognitive issues, um, potential things like difficulty, um, on course planning. So like research has shown that elite level golfers have the ability to utilize like cognitive techniques. And one of the main ones is attentional narrowing, which is the ability to avoid irrelevant cues and then concentrate on the relevant ones uh, to perform like a skilled task. And this is something that amateur players really struggle with. And I, again, come back to an example we used with Brandon um, is one of the examples you can see on the right there. And these are a couple of the um, neural cognitive programs we use. Uh, neuro tracker, play attention, Dynavision, um, is we put the play attention, which is a little sensor you wear on your body, and it can actually read brainwave activity. So it can tell us when are we getting into a steady state or a, a level of focus or this attentional narrowing. We put it on Brandon, we have, it, have him stand over the golf ball. He never hits a golf ball until his attentional narrowing, or we look at this graph of how your brainwave activity is working till it gets to a steady state. We look at a lot of amateur players when they stand over the golf ball, they never get there or they get there prior to hitting the golf ball. And then when they're swinging, they lose all of their attention and focus. So lots of really cool to tools that we use um, to train. And some of these, like, again, we'll put these sensors on and some of it will be simple stuff that you can do from home, stuff that you can do, come in and you sit in front of a computer, but we want to make these as sport specific as soon as possible. So put some of these things on it, put a golf club in your hand and are you able to actually focus? And we can read this data like in real time um, while you're doing things. And again, if you, you can't use the mental aspect, it doesn't matter how much you're doing in the other parts of your game. Awesome. That's really cool. 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 Uh, and then I really just quickly like um, number of referral partners that, uh, um, that we, we work with. So again, if you are, on the more elite level, we have sports psychology partners that that, that we work with, nutrition, vision, uh, sports medicine, doctors, naturopath, which isn't on here, but um, we we work in the area where we're experts and we've kind of assembled a team um, of great practitioners to refer out to for when we need them. Well, I'm not a vision expert, we screen for it, but 
getting to the root cause, we need a, an optometrist or a nutritionist for dietary stuff that that can work with our players to, to achieve what they need to. And instead of kind of go having you guys go and go to Google and not necessarily work with the correct individual who's going to really help the cause and be aligned with the team, we've vetted a series of professionals in different areas of Ontario to help support these programs. Um, so we will provide those recommendations to you. And then we do collaborate and work closely with those people to make sure we're all contributing to the outcomes of your program. Awesome. Um, perfect. I will uh, follow finish up on this one. And I know we're a little bit of, up against it. So I'll kind of, I won't breathe through this one, but I'll just kind of touch on it here. And it's just on course lessons. And I'll kind of use another sport. It's like, just because you can skate and shoot and pass doesn't mean you're a good hockey player, right? So just because we can hit drivers and we can hit irons and we can hit wedges and we can hit roll a putt straight, well, that doesn't mean that we can be a good golfer. So the on-course lesson part is where we can start to learn on how to play the game, right? There's a lot more to shooting low scores than just hitting it solid, right? So we have to understand, like, what does a lie do to a shot? Like, if you come up, my favorite, one of my favorite things is the dissertation that Phil Mickelson gave to David Faraday on his show one time about, like, what he looks at in a lie. And, and like, most people don't even understand what a lie does to a shot. As simple as in a fairway. I was with a, a senior uh, elite player and, and and we were in the middle of the fairway and, and I was like okay what do you see on this line he's like looked at me like I was crazy he's like what do you mean I'm in the fairway I'm like well yeah but look at the lie like it's on a little downhill slope the it's growing into the grain like there's some things that this lie is going to do to this golf ball that we have to adjust for so things like that that you just can't teach on the range um shot selection target selection understanding your shot shape and when a flag is trying to goad you into a mistake or not how to understand what's a red light flag what's a green light flag right improving your strategy how to attack a hole like when i get on a tee deck we have to design it from the green to the tee like you know we don't just hit a shot and try to figure out where we want to go from there but understanding on how to create a strategy from the green to the tee based on your strengths, right? Every player's got strengths, they're just different. So we need to understand when we're attacking a golf ball, how do we attack it so I can maximize my strengths and minimize my weaknesses? So these are the things that we do on the golf course in the lessons that go so far above um, just hitting the ball solid. Because- and again, this is stuff that we would kind of look at in the season. So the kind of the whole way the program would work is Let's get you assessed. Let's work on the foundational movements. Let's get you striking the ball well. And then when we get into the season, we, we've laid all the groundwork. And now it's how do we score well? Um, yeah. At the end of the day, golf is a game of how good is your miss. Tiger Woods has been quoted as saying, like, the amount of perfect shots he hits in a round of golf, like, if he hits four, that's about as good as he could ever play. So if Tiger's looking to hit four perfect shots in a round of golf, like we better be hoping we hit one good one. So if we don't know what our miss is and where our miss is going to go, it's very hard to attack a golf ball. And 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 that's that is the game of golf. Because the difference between me and Rory McIlroy from 150 yards is like where our misses go. Because when we both hit it perfectly, it's going to go right where we want it to go. It's when I miss it and when he miss it, it's a little bit farther away, mine. So, so we need to understand how do we attack it? What is a lie going to do to affect how I cleanly hit the ball? If I'm in a bunker and it's plugged, what do we do? If, uh, you know, all of these things go into playing a good round of golf and being able to keep the score on the rails and not have it go, uh, you know, seven, eight, nines on a hole. And I think that's, you guys have really teed up what the winter golf leading into actual playing season is all about. So it starts with the foundational MRI, building a custom program based on your body's movement, your swing patterns, and your goals in the game of golf. Dan and Brandon did an amazing job explaining the detail that goes into the golf MRI and how much care and effort they put into truly looking at the individual. 
We've then done a really great job explaining all the different components. And again, not all of these may apply to your level of golf. They're picked and choose or chosen, sorry, uh, based on your goals, where you're at, and what you're looking to accomplish. And then Brandon did a great job teeing up how this would lead into on-course management during the season. And it's all about periodization. Um, is there any closing remarks that you guys have tonight? I know we've gone a little bit over and we really appreciate everybody staying on. And again, I do apologize for the technology issues. I don't know how that happened, um, but I just wanted to pass it off uh, to Brandon and Dan for any closing remarks. And then what we can do is follow up via email with all of you for any questions that you may have um, so we can get everybody home at a reasonable time tonight. Totally. Yeah, I, think that, I don't know much else to uh, to add. Um, if you go to the, the next slide as well, too, um, I think our email address might be on there. If not, it's um, both the, the Hansberger Golf and AIM Golf Academy Instagram stuff. Um, lots of the, it's going to start having lots of the same information that we've posted here, as well as like lots of tips that can kind of help you, um, along with your game, um, and kind of what we're doing in the clinic and kind of keeps you up to date to what's, uh, what's going on here. I, and I would just say like, the one thing I hope that you can gain from today is we're just passionate about what we do and what we do is help players play the game they like better and have a better overall health and, and wellness in their body and we're super passionate about it we're very fortunate that this is what we get to do for a living which is put smiles on people's faces and and help people achieve their goals so we feel pretty lucky that that people um trust in us to you know to put their time and effort and, and money into into you know helping them be where they are so we we don't take that for granted we, we realize you guys put your trust in us and we work hard um, because of that. There was a great question um, in the chat just now um, about pricing. So what we are going to do is send over all the pricing elements of our programs and the different aspects of the periodization over to everybody via email tomorrow. So you'll be able to reference the price list, but then you can also follow up with Dan and Brandon. We know some of you have been through different parts of golf assessments with us as loyal clients. So we're going to work with everybody to make sure that they're fitting into this golf MRI process where it makes the most sense as, as, as in terms of what you've done with us before. So we will absolutely be following up with you on that tomorrow. 100%. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody again for joining us this evening. We appreciate your attention, but we also really hope that you've taken something away in terms of how you can properly train during this off season. So whether you're staying in town, you're going away, you're going down south, this, all of these programs can be done. The, the assessment must be done in person, but we can continue to monitor and coach you virtually or in person over the course of the winter as well. So there's lots of different options here. Um, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thanks guys. everyone. Have a great evening. Have a good night.